This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Welcome everybody, welcome all our Torah Anytime viewers. So tonight, okay, so tonight, tonight's an interesting class. Tonight we're going to go really deep, really, really, really deep. The, um, but anybody could still understand this, even if you don't have the, the depths of this. The way that I like to explain it is something like this. If you listen to this class, you will understand it. But if you listen to this class, then you will understand it. But if you listen, then you will understand it. Does anybody understand what I just did? The difference over there. That, so, they're, they're, you know, for even the beginners are here, or if anybody's in the beginning level, like you're going to get something out of this class. That's for sure. Uh, it just might be a headache, but you'll get something out of it. The, but if you really pay attention, if you're really focusing along the way, this is going to change your life. The, your Rosh Hashanah is never going to be the same. The ability, we're going to be speaking about the show for tonight. And your ability to understand the depths and the secrets of what's going on over here should blow your mind. It should not, like, when I was, every time that I just think about this, I get so excited. It's like, this is so awesome. Like, we don't realize the beauty and the amazing Torah that we have. We don't realize what the, the amazing mitzvah that God did us and the secrets behind it. So today, Bezat Hashem, we're going to reveal a, like a smidget of a smidget of the, the, the secrets of the, of the Shofar. So when we look at Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, we know that one of the, mo- the most Oh, thank you, Abdul. I, I, I just forgot that. I just asked you that before. I, tonight's food is sponsored. Le ilu nishmat? No. Fua shlema. Le fua shlema to, de, uh, to David Ben Farnez. Farnaz. Um, may you have a complete and a speedy recovery. Okay, so... Location. Location, thank you. Um, you think I wouldn't be here every week, right? I don't do this stuff. Okay, so everyone is always welcome to join us at 1601... Quentin Road on Thursdays for women at BJX location and uh, for men on Tuesdays at 630 Avenue S uh, at 8 p.m. as well. I do have to say that the girls class, you guys, what you guys put out here, the spread, every time there's more food over here. There's like sushi, pizza. There's, a party. Uh, there's always a breakfast party. There's always other party, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. So whoever, even if you don't want a class, if you just want free food, uh, <laughs> just come and join us, uh, you know, for some, for some delicious free food. Okay, so, uh, okay, so now, now let's, let's, uh, let's begin to the real stuff. Okay, so we know that one of the main mitzvot of, of Rosh Hashanah is to hear the blowing of the shofar. And we know this is a pasuk in Numbers, in Bamidbar, chapter 29, verse 1. It says, Yom Tua Yalachem, it will be a day of shofar sounding for you. The Rambam learns that it's a biblical commandment that is an obligation that we are required to go and hear the shofar. So we, ha- we have to hear the shofar. By the way, the, the obligation is to hear the shofar, not to actually sound the shofar. So the obligation is to hear the shofar, which... which should give you a little bit like, okay, there's something over here, hearing, understanding, there's something deeper than just making a shofar sound. There's hearing the shofar. The well, we're, way we're going to go today is I'm going to share with you Rav Sadia Gons. He gave 10 reasons for the shofar. And we're going to go and we're going to go try to explain all these 10 reasons and we're going to combine them into, uh, into one. So, number one, what was the 10 reasons? Why do we have to do a shofar sound? If you think about it, if you, if you think about it, what is the idea of the shofar? Like, why do we make such a big deal about it? If you think it, it, it's, it's really such a big deal, the shofar, it's a noise. Like, why do we care so much about a noise? Like, someone is blowing a trumpet. Very good. Why are we changing our lives? Why are we going and you have women running over to, to the synagogues? You have listening to this. And there's like babies crying. There people going crazy. The shofar, the shofar. It's always unbelievable. So how was the shofar guy this time? Well, you know, he didn't spit this time. You know, you know man, people rate them on a level, you know. It's a good thing, but thank God we don't have Yelp for Jewish chazan and, and shofar stuff. Because that's going to, uh, you know, be terrible for Lashon Hara. But... You know, there, there is some, something going on over here. Now, what is so important about the shofar? So, if Sadia Gon shares 10 reasons, let us go through quickly through those 10 reasons, and then we'll go and try to explain them more in depth. Number one, he says, why do we have a shofar sound on Rosh Hashanah? Because on Rosh Hashanah is when God gets coronated as king. When there's a coronation of a king, it sounds with trumpets and loud noise. So the, hence, God is getting coronated as a king on this day on Rosh Hashanah. That's why we blow the shofar. That's number one. And this is also the Mabba brings down in Numbers chapter 10 verse 2. That's what a tkia is, a long, uh, a st- a straight uh, shofar blast. That is the coronation of, uh, of a king. That's, uh, that's number one. Number two, it is, it says, uh, says Rab Sadia Gohan, that the shofar has a quality to arouse ev- anybody to do tshuva, to do repentance. And in fact, there is a pasuk in Amos, chapter 3, verse 6, that says, Will a shofar be sounded in the city and no one will tremble? 
says everybody's going to wake up. And in fact, the Rambam, Maimonides, he goes on and it says, it says, what is a shofar sound is? A shofar sound is that you, it's going to go, it says, Ari Yishenim and Nishnaschem. I'm sorry, can you pass me a, a tissue? I'm sweating already. I don't know how you guys are. Okay, this is, you know. Um, he says, Ari Yishenim and Nishnaschem. Thank you. He says, wake up, you sleepy ones from your slumber. Wake up and do tshuva. You have to wake up. And what wakes you up? A shofar sound. That's what's going to wake you up. How, why, when, where? That's what we're going to get to. Number, that was number two. Number three. The shofar, it evokes a shofar blast that we had on Har Sinai. When we got the Torah, we also, there were also allowed shofar blasts, and this evokes that, that, uh, uh, you know, that shofar blast as well. Number four, it echoes the cries of the prophets. The cries of the prophets that used to go and scream at the Jewish people and say, do tshuva, repent from your sinful ways, do tshuva. The shofar is going and it's, it's evoking that as well. Number five, it reminds us of the war cries. In general, in the olden days, um, there used to be, uh, you know, when people would fight, you know, hand-to-hand combat, they would fight with, with screaming noises and they would sound loud noises because it terrifies the people and it, it throws them off balance. But in particular, what Rav Sadiqon is referring to over here is the, shof- is the loud war cries when the temple was destroyed, when the walls were breached and the temple was destroyed. Number six, that was number five. Number six, it reminds us of a ram's horn. Does anybody know why a ram's horn? Yeah. Okay, this is very good. The sacrifice of Yitzchak, which we're going to get to, we're going to explain. This is the, the almost the near sacrifice of Yitzchak. This evokes the memory of the ram which was sacrificed instead of Yitzchak. That was number six. Number seven, it's a loud piercing sound that humbles us. Have you ever been alone in the world? No, I'm kidding. In your house. And all of a sudden, there is the thunder gets so loud that the house shakes, right? So as a man, we, you know, of course, never get upset. We're like, whoa, I'm not scared of nothing, you know. I'm a man, you know. But, you know, like, it, it humbles you. I'll tell you that much. Hum- I'm saying if you really heard, like, a thunder lightning, you know, like, well, you usually don't hear the lightning part. But if you really heard the thunder part, and it's like, it's something that would, like, shake your soul, it's, it's going to humble you, right? If you get, if you're really angry, like, you're like, oh, and then there's like a thunder, you're like, huh? You know, like, it's like that squirrel that's eating that nut, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, like, what was that? You know, all of a sudden, like, so it humbles you. A chauffeur sound is supposed to humble you. Number eight, nine, and ten, we're going to put them all together. It, there is something very special in the end of days, and it, that it refers to a shofar. In fact, in Sfania, chapter 1, verse 16, regarding the final day of judgment, the, the final judgment, it also says there's going to be a shofar sound. On Mashiach, we know there's going to be a shofar sound. In the resurrection of the dead, there's also going to be a shofar sound. So we have here a few ideas of, of, of what the shofar is evoking, what the shofar is, is, uh, is, is coming to, to bring us to. Now, when we take all this at a glance, we see that there, there's some serious stuff going on over here. If you think about it, shofar is in like a really important parts in, in the, I guess in the history of the world. Number one, you have, let's say for example, the Torah. When the Torah is given to the Jewish people, shofar. When Mashiach is going to come, shofar. When the resurrection, shofar. You have like big events, shofar. One of the most you know, important days of the year, Rosh Hashanah, shofar. So there must be some sort of connection in like humongous information that we're missing out over here. That's number one. Number two, the, um, it, it also helps us with tshuva. Now the question is why, how? Like, you know, okay, a loud noise is going to help you. With so you just sound the car alarm. You know, like, what is, like, the shofar that evokes the, memory, the, 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 the push, the drive for doing tshuva? And finally, there is an interesting halakha, Magen Avram brings this down, that says that we don't blow the shofar on Erev Rosh Hashanah to confuse the satan. Now, I always had a question of this. Like, you know, the satan is, was, is not new to the scene, right? He's been around for a little bit of time, right? He's not going to be like, you know, like, comes Erev Rosh Hashanah, you know, and there's like no show for him. Satan's like, what's going on? He's like, no what's You know, like, uh, confuses him. Doesn't he not remember what happened last year or the year before? Or 5,700, you know, like, the, all throughout, like, does he not remember what was going on since the beginning of time? What is this confusing the Satan? And in fact, the Satan has a lot, it, it, it actually has a lot of, uh, of, of you know, connection with the, with the Shofar. So let's try to understand this. Now before we begin, let's just, uh, you know, when I was giving the guys class, the men's class, um, we, had a, we had a few beginners over there, so I was going through each sound every time, which when I was thinking about it, if I would listen to myself on that, I'll be, you know, it sounds like every few minutes I'll be going, do, 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 you know, so... I'm going to change it up a little bit just for the sake of, uh, you know, sounding normal. Um, so I'm going to tell you all the names of the shofar sound and then how many sounds it sound and that's where, where we're going to go. So we know there's a tkia. Tkia is one long sound. So that's doo, right? We'll do it one time, right? Or we'll entertain people one time. Right? That's the tkia. Then you have shvarim. Shvarim is the three sound. It's doo, doo, doo. That's the, that's the shvarim. 
And then you have the tua, which is the nine sound, which is don't count me how much ever was If it was more than nine, it's still yotze. So um, that is that is the sound. So uh, the way that I'll say it, I'll say tkia one, shvarim three, trua nine. Okay, good so far. Okay, so now let me share with you something from the shlach hakadosh. The shlach hakadosh says like this: it says that you know the cycle of the of the shofar is tkia one long one, shvarim three. Trua, nine, and then a long one again, another tki at the end. He says, what is this, what is this cycle it's a reference to? He says this is something that's going a lot deeper than just sound. It says that when God goes and creates you into this world, creates a soul, you come down as a pure soul. You come down into this world, you're like a tki, you're like that one clean sound. Then you come down into this world and you do a sin. And you do many sins, unfortunately. So that is in reference to the three broken sounds, the shvarim. That is the broken, the broken of, this, of the soul is breaking up and it's, uh, is, is full of sin. Then is the tua. Then is the fact that tua is the, is the tshuva process. Tua is like the nine short blasts. If you realize when somebody is crying, so there is, there is stages of crying. When someone's really crying, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, a, you know, that, 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 that rapid cycle. That's like, you know, like the really crying. There's always, there's like, there's like the sad, you know, I just saw Disney movie, you know, like, oh my God, you know, Mufasa, you know, like, you, whatever, you know, so you go and you're sad about that. But then there's like the real crying, that's the, that's the, the, the rapid, thing. that's the rapid crying. It says that is the tshuva process. You're so, you're so far down from where you're falling, you're trying to get back to where you are, and that is the trua. And then finally, after you go through the trua, you get back to the tkiah to get to your full uh, cycle that you are in the beginning with. That is why, says the Shlach Kadosh, he says, you know, that the pasuk says, that we said in the beginning, Yom Tua Yelachem, it will be a day of true sounding. The true was the nine. Why isn't it when the Torah speaks about shofar, it says Yom Tkia Yelachem, it will be a day of a Tkia sound, the one, right? You, if you think, you know, what is the main, you know, shofar sound, you would say the first one, you know, the, one, the long one. Like, why would it be, out of all the true, out of all the shofar sounds, the Torah picks Trua, which is the nine broken up one. Because the nine broken up one, <coughs> excuse me, its essence is Tshuva. And that is the essence of the shofar. The essence of the shofar is the tshuva, and that's why it specifically says Yom Tua Yalachem. It will be a day of shofar sounding, and specifically uses the um, the word of tua. The medrash says something like this. It says that in pasuk in Tehillim, in chapter eighty-nine, verse sixteen, it says Ashrei Ha'am Yodea Tua. Fortunate is the nation that knows the tshuva. The tua, the tua sound is again is that nine. Now the question that the Medrash asks, it says, it says, I don't understand, what is, like, fortunate is a nation that knows the nine, you know, you know, toot, 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 toot sound of the shofar. The non-Jews can't do it? Anybody could do that sound. What is so special about the Jewish people that know how to do the true sound? And in fact, if you go online and you type in shofar sound, nine out of ten times you're going to have Jesus for Jesus going and blowing the shofar sound, thinking they're trying to get, you know, all these, you know, juice of that. They're, you go online, you try to find shofar sounds, the nine out of ten times are going to be, you know, Christianity stuff. The non-Jews also know how to blow shofar, not just the Jews. So why does the King David say in Tehidim, Ashrei ha'am yodat wa, fortunate is a nation that knows the true sound. Answers the, the Shvile Pinchas, or Pinchas Friedman, it says, because the Jews know how to utilize the shofar sound. To make a shofar sound, <coughs> anybody can do that, excuse me. But to utilize a shofar sound, that only a Jew can do. And now let me share you a secret on how to utilize the shofar sound. So there's a Rabbeinu Nisan on the Gemara, in Rosh Hashanah, that says when Adam was created, something very interesting, the day that Adam was created, God commanded him, do not eat from the tree. On the day that he was commanded not to eat from the tree, he ate from the tree. On the day that he ate, right, typical man, right? Uh, and the day that he, well, uh, okay. So, uh, if anybody knows the story, okay. So, it, but then, it, the day that he was commanded to eat, not to eat from the tree, he ate from the tree. The day that he ate from the tree, he was, you know, he went and he actually did tshuva from the tree, from the sin. And the day that he did tshuva, he was exonerated. All this happened on the same day that he was created. What day was that? Rosh Hashanah. That was the day that Adam Arishan was created on Rosh Hashanah. Says that Ariza, says that you know that Adam, when he sinned, it wasn't just him. He had all the souls inside of him. He had the souls of the righteous people. He had the souls of the wicked people. And everybody was mixed up with him. And the souls of the wicked actually went and they were able to go and pour, force him to go and do the sin. But they were all connected. They were all part of them. That's why it's something very interesting. God, uh, you know, Adam Elishon had a few uh, curses that came after it. Number one, he had to go and he had to go and he had to work now for a living. But he also, now he was no longer going to live forever. He was supposed to live forever until a certain point. Now he's no longer living forever. So now, 
The question is asked, what about us? It says, we didn't do part of the sin. It says, where are we come so much afterwards? Why do we have to suffer from Adam and sin? The answer is because we're also part of it. We're all part of Adam and Chava, all that, that original sin, we're also part of it. So now, when we go look at the story of Adam and Chava, in, in Genesis chapter 3 verse 9, it says that after Adam and did a sin, he went and God goes over to him. Ba'ikra Hashem Elohim el Adam, lo ayaka. And God goes over to Adam and he says, Ayaka. Ayaka means, where are you? Now, God wasn't playing Marco Polo with Adam. He wasn't like, Adam, where are you? He's like, I got something really important to tell you. you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't like, a, like God, of course, knew where, where Adam was. So why is God asking Adam Alishon, Ayaka, where are you? God knows where he is. Says Rav Shneir Zaman of Ladai, the, the, the Baal Tanya, the author of the Tanya, one of the, you know, the, the founder of the movement of Chabad. He goes and he says like this. He says, when God was asking Adam Arishon Ayaka, where are you? He wasn't asking God, where are you in the physical sense? He was asking, where are you in the spiritual sense? He says, Adam, a few hours ago I created you. You are on the pinnacle of creation. You are so high. Now you sinned. You went so far down. Ayaka, where are you? Where are you in the spiritual sense? How far have you fallen? Says, says uh, Rav Shneir Zaman, says, uh, you know, the Baal Tanya, that this, you know, when, when God says something, it doesn't just stop. You, know, you think about like the way that human people speak. So when we speak, you know, we have to take a breath. We have to pause. We have to, you know, wait. So we have to speak. And then we say one sentence and we say another sentence. God doesn't need all that. God could speak and God could just, you know, anything. And multiple things at the same time. It, it, it's beyond our capability to understand. But God doesn't speak like human beings. Says uh, the... Okay, he says, when it says, when the Pasuk says, I'm sorry, when the Pasuk says that God spoke on Har Sinai, it says, Lo Yifsak, he didn't stop. What does that mean, says Targum Okunas? That he will never speak, that the words that came out of, of, of God never stops. Which means is, that the Pasuk says, when you look at, when you look at the Pasuk in, um, in, uh, in Genesis, and I'm sorry, in Shemos, when God spoke on Har Sinai, it says that God spoke you know, by the mountain with fire, and it says, and it didn't end. What does it mean it didn't end? It means that His words never end. It always continues. It always continues. Meaning that just like God spoke to Adam HaRishon on Rosh Hashanah when, uh, when He was created, and He says, Ayaka, where are you? He says, every single year on that day, which is Rosh Hashanah, God asks every single person, every single one of us, Ayaka, where are you? I brought you into this world on such a high spiritual state, and now where are you right now, Ayaka? The idea is over here, is this is really what is the shofar sounding. When, God, when, when we're doing the shofar, what are we doing? We're saying over here, God created us in the tkia, in a one long sound. Then we broke it up with the shvarim. We broke it up with the three broken ones. And now we have to do tshuva to get back to the tkiah, to get to the, back to the long one. What is all that saying? That's God saying like, where are you? I created you at tkiah, now you're a shvarim. You have to do what? You have to do the tua. You have to do the tshuva to get back to the tkiah. You have to get back to that. Says the shvile pinchas, says the pinchas him beautifully. He says, the secret all lies in, in the word ayeka. And we're going to break down the word ayeka and we're going to be able to go and see how to get back to that state of the full tkiah. You're, are you guys with me so far? You with me? Okay. You can just say yes, even though I am like, oh, I'm sorry about it. Okay. Ayaka has four letters. Aleph, Yud, Kaf, and Hey. So now let's look at each one of these four letters and try to uncover what is the secret behind them. So Aleph, there's a Gemara in Shabbat, page 104a, that says like this. That says, it goes through every single letter what it means. What is Aleph? Aleph Bina means, I will teach you wisdom. I will teach you, meaning you learn Torah. Aleph is in reference to learning Torah. The Gemara in Kedushin, page 30, says that Barati, uh, God tells the Jewish people, says, Barati Yetzahara, I created the evil inclination, but Barati Torah Tavlin, I created an antidote to it. And that antidote is the Torah. Think of it, think of it this, this scenario. So, um, you know, you, you know there's, there are people that uh, make their money by uh, standing on Times Square and taking pictures with people. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know if they're making money, but they're, they're whatever, they're charging. Sorry. Right? They're trying, yeah. So... Imagine you're walking past by, um, you know, over there. Oh, not you. Somebody else is walking past by over there. And uh, they see over there to, you know, out of the ordinary. Usually you see Elmo and the Sesame Gang and, you know, anybody else. But this time you see, like, two African tribe men. 
you know, they're like painted, they got bones in their ears, right? They're like real Africa. They're like, you know, it's like zero below zero, and they're in their tutu, right? They're like in the serious, you know, African, uh, you know, garb over there. And they're taking, you know, taking pictures. And, you know, two, let's make them girls walk by. And uh, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, let's take a picture. That's so totally, it's okay. You know, and they go in, and they take a picture, you know, with these. And then, you know, you know, you know, Mutambo and, you know, Mustafa over there, he's like, uh, He's like, you know, one dolo, you know, you know, you have to pay for it. And the two girls were like, I'm so sorry, you know, we don't have any money on us, you know, like, I'm sorry, we don't have credit card, you take credit card? And he's like, you know, he's obviously, he's like, no, and as, as they're, you know, walking away, you know, Mutambo says to Mustafa, he's like, you know, these white people, he's like, I don't like them. And what he does is, he takes out a little tube from his, you know, little sheath over there, and he goes and he's like, and he's like, you know, hits one of the girls, and, you know, he gets like with like a dart to her neck. And she like falls down, and you know Mustafa walks up to her, and he says, um, "I will give you the antidote for one dollar." <laughs> now, what do you think that girl is gonna do? She's gonna be like, "I don't need your antidote," you know. I'm gonna get my Starbucks, and that's it. You know, like, no, you're gonna go and you're gonna find a dollar to give Mustafa and Mutambo, and be like, "Please give me the antidote to that." You're not gonna go. Why? Because in general, if someone gives you a poison. First of all, stay away from that person next time. But if someone gives you a poison and he's going to give you the antidote, don't start looking for an antidote anywhere else. Go to the person that gave you the poison. And then never go to that person again. But go to him for that one final part to get, to get the antidote. Says, you know, says God. God says, I created this world. There's an evil inclination in this world. You know how many people go and say like, I could be a good person, I don't need the Torah. No, you can't. No, you can't. That's like going and telling Mutambo, I'll figure it out myself. What do you have in here? You know, some leaves from the African tribe virus? I'll figure it out. You know, and he will say, I wish you best of luck. You know, and then, you know, a few steps and then, you know, you know, you're carved out for chicken. You, you, you know, like, if you're going and if you, really, if you really want the antidote to a poison, you go to the creator of the poison. God created the evil inclination. And God said very, very simply and straight out in the Gemara in Kedushin, page 38. He says, I created the poison. And his name is the Yetzahara, the evil inclination, the Satan. He says, I have an antidote. The antidote is the Torah. If you think you could beat him without the Torah, then you're fooling yourself. The first thing we learn from Ayeka is the Aleph. You want to do tshuva? There's only one way. There's only one way, and that is the way through the Torah. That is the Aleph. Let's go on to the Yud. The, the Yud is, uh, represents, the Yud, if you, if you look, if you understand the Hebrew alphabet, the Yud is the smallest of letters. The smallest, the tiniest, tiniest of letters. Uh, and the Yud represents humility. The Oysis of the Rabbi Akiva says that if somebody goes and acquires the trait of Yud, the trait of humility, then he acquires Olam Haba. He acquires the next world. It says, why is that? There's, there's an interesting pasuk in, in Ishayahu that says like this. It says, Ki bika Hashem tzu olamim. God created the world, this world and the next world, with a Yud and a He. This world he created with a He. We'll soon see why. The next world he created with a Yud. Says, says Rabbi Akiva, it says, if you want to get to the next world, you have to follow the quality trait of a Yud. And the quality trait of a Yud is humility. He says, humility is an essence that you need. And by the way, humility is such, a, such an important, such an important uh, you know, character trait to have. In fact, says the Shvili Pinchas, says, you know, one of the main sins, one of the, the crux of the sins of the, of the tree was arrogance. How, why is it arrogance? Because the Pasuk says, he says, what did the Satan go to Chava and Adam? He says, if you eat from this tree, you will be like God, knowing good and bad. Which means is, I am like where I am right now, but I could, be, I could be something like somebody else. I could be something greater. I could be something, you know, not by me working myself. Something that I could gain for myself comes from arrogance. So, oh, I want to be like God. Of course I want to be like God. I want to know between good and bad. I want to be able to create. I want to do all those things. It comes from arrogance. The sin of the, of the, of the etzadas, the sin of the tree, was a sin of arrogance. Says, says, now you need the yud. Ayeka, says God, God to, to Adam and Ayeka, where are you? You need the aleph, you need the Torah. Now you need the yud to go and get out of the, of the arrogance. That's why it's something very interesting. You realize we said that Adam Arishon now has to die. Beforehand, he didn't have to die. Why all of a sudden now he has to die? Out of all this thing, why did God have to make him have to die? Let him, you know, have something else. Let him live forever. Why is it death? There is a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, in the third chapter in Pirkei Avot, the first Mishnah, it says, Akiva ben Mehal al-Omer. Akiva ben Mehal says that if If you go and you do three things, you look at three things, you're not going to come to sin. What is one of them? Where are you going to end up with? You're going to end up in a place full of maggots and worms. If you're going to end up, if a person thinks about the day of death, 
it's got to hum, humble you a little bit somehow. You know, like how angry can you be that someone cut you off if, you know, in a, you know if after 100 years, 120 years, you're going to be sitting in six feet underground, eating by, eat, being eaten by like maggots and worms. It humbles you. Says, says God, the, this, is how, this is how the beauty of it works. He says, Adam Elishon had arrogance. How do we get arrogance? Now, arrogance, you're living forever, you have arrogance. Yeah, I'm never going to die. Well, you can do anything. Uh, that's why some people still think that way. But you can do anything. But now that you die, all of a sudden it puts an arrogance to sense. You know, when, when we do sins, we think God's punishing us because God hates us. Oh, I, see, I can't believe you, you know, disobeyed me. It's a consequence. It's like someone puts his hands in fire and then he gets burned and he complains, why? Why did I get burned? Because I mean, you put your hand in something hot, you get burned. It's a consequence. It's not like a punishment, it's a consequence. If Adam Aishan did a sin of arrogance, the consequence now is to bring humility. How do you bring humility? You bring death. Through death, you bring humility. So we know to get out of it, this is the youth of Ayeka. You have to get out of the, um, of the arrogance. The next is Kaf. Kaf of Ayeka is Kaf Yad. Kaf Yad is, is in reference to Tztaka. We know that the Pasuk says in, uh, in Mishlei, chapter 10, verse 2, Tztaka tatzil mimavis. Charity saves from death. And by the way, if people can't do charity with money, you can do charity with time, you can do charity with... There's a lot of things they can do charity with. It doesn't only necessarily mean money. You can, you, there's, there's many different aspects of a charity. But charity saves from death. And this is what we know also, coming before Al Shana, it's a very big time, you know, to give, uh, to give as much charity as you can. You know, you're able to change a decree with these things. So that is the Kaf of Ayaka. And finally, the He of Ayaka, that is in reference to Tshuva. Why is the He in reference to Tshuva? Something very interesting. If you realize, the fifth blessing of the Shemona Esrei is Hashivenu, which is for Tshuva. What does it start with? A He. What does it end with? But Tshuva also, it ends with also the He. It ends with the He, it starts with the He. By the way, if you take the He and the He and the Five and the Five, you get a Ten, that's a Ten Days of Repentance. We're not going to, it's a different class in itself. But the He in, its, in essence is the Tshuva. Why is He Tshuva? Something very interesting. You know, the way that the hay is shaped, so the hay is shaped something like this, right? The world was created with the hay because the world is open. You could fall, if you want, you could fall down. You could fall all the way down inside. But God left a little opening right over here that you could climb back in through tshuva. That's the difference between hay and a chet. Chet means sin. Chet is closed. Chet means that you're doing the sin and you're not doing anything in any tshuva. But a hay means that you're going back and you're climbing and you're doing the tshuva. So the ayaka of the hay means do tshuva, do repentance. So we see over here four different aspects of ayaka. When God told Adam and Hashan, ayaka, where are you? What was God telling him? He says, number one, you have Torah. Number two, you have you, you have the humility. You have the, the kaf, you have staka, And the hay, you have the tshuva. Now, let's put that inside and let's move on. And we'll plug it in all very, very shortly. There's a Gemara in Rosh Hashanah. A very interesting Gemara. In page 16.8, it says like this. It says that God tells, God tells us, and He says, Tiku shel ayel. Blow in front of me a, a shofar of a ram, and then, mali, and then it, what is that? It says, in the, it says in the Gemara that I will remember the sacrifice of Yitzchak. And then, umali ani alechem, ki ilu And I will be as if you sacrifice yourself in front of me. Now that's a very, very interesting Gemara. Let, let's just recap on that Gemara. The Gemara says, blow in front of the shofar, I'll remember Isaac, I'll remember Yitzhak, the sacrifice, and I'll make it as if you sacrificed yourself in front of me. Now that is nice, that's awesome. Like, uh, you know, I'll take it and run. You know, like, that's great. But like, does that make any sense? Like, Okay, so we blow a whistle, and the whistle wasn't a referee, and the referee once saved his life for somebody, and because he saved the life for somebody, you know, he was also a grandfather, so this way, and he was also, his great-grandfather had a lot of money, so therefore, if we blow the whistle, we're going to have a lot of money. Like, the, how far are we going back over here? What is in reference, what is the connection that we're dealing over here that is going to be as if, as if we also sacrifice ourselves? So let's try to understand this, this beautiful idea of, of, the, of blowing the shofar, specifically of a ram, on Rosh Hashanah. So we know, I'd, uh, you know, God goes to Abraham Avinu and he says, I want you to go and sacrifice your son. Now, that's a big test in itself. But I don't think most people understand what's the level of that test was. You realize that Abraham Avinu, he was the one that screamed at everybody else and says, God doesn't want you to sacrifice your children to him. God doesn't want human sacrifice. And this is what he's preaching for like years and years. And all of a sudden God goes to Abraham and he says, guess what? I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son, Yitzchak. Now, Abraham goes and he has to go and he has to sacrifice his you know, son. Did he actually sacrifice his son? Finally, no, he didn't. He did not sacrifice his you know, son. But then... It says something very interesting. We know that it says that we blow the shofar and it's as if God remembers the sacrifice of Yitzchak. What sacrifice? He never sacrificed. Furthermore, the, you know, the, the Torah tells us that God keeps Yitzchak's ashes under the, the throne of the glory. Under the Kisei What ashes? 
There was no ashes to begin with. What ashes are we dealing with over here? And, 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 and the final thing, if we really want to like, evoke the memory of Yitzchak and Akedah and the sacrifice, why are we blowing the horn? Why are we blowing the shofar? Let us build a makeshift uh, you know, altar. I don't know. Get a, you know. Ask one of your ISIS friends and say, could I have a knife? You know, and put a knife on, the, on the, you know, in Rosh Hashanah. Remember the sacrifice. That's the sacrifice. The shofar is a sacrifice? What's a sacrifice? How is this reminding anything? That, that actually reminds the opposite. It reminds that he wasn't sacrificed. It reminds that he was the ram instead of him. So now I want to share with you something beautiful from Mepsim Chabanam of Peshista that says like this. It says that we know in Yishtabach, uh, when we pray, the, the, the tefillah says, Abochel bishirei zimra. Now, the literal translation of this makes, it's very hard to understand. Abochel means choses. Bishirei is like song, zimra of song. It's just different things of song. It says, why is it that the sages, when they put the, the, the prayers together, why did they say that God chooses the songs of songs? Like in almost the same vernacular, you know, different words, but the same, you know, meaning on it. So, Rav Simcha Rav Peshishka goes and explains like this. It says, you know, a good Jew, when he goes and he prays, and, or she prays, and they, they finish praying, and they're like, you know what? I just wish I could pray again. Because, you know, I was spacing out, you know, like, you know, I just got my nails done. You know, I, whatever, it's like I got distracted. It's like there's so many other things that are going through our minds, unfortunately, that they're so, you know, like, we could have, sometimes we're like, oh, I wish I could do it again. I wish I could do it again, I could do it better. Says, says, you know what God, God does when you want to do something, but you're, it's out of your, response, your ability to do it, it counts as if you did it. So, Habochel b'shirei zimra. B'shirei is also the same words as shiraim, which means leftover, the remnants. That God goes, and God now has two, two options. He says, you have your prayer that you gave. Your prayer that you gave was like, uh, you know, at best. Yeah, you said a few words, you, you know, you got your Amazon shopping that you wanted from God, and then you went and you continued, you know, with, with the prayers. But that's your prayer. But then there's like another prayer that you really wanted to give, like a prayer of like the cattle, you know, like a prayer of a prayer you're talking about. If you realize... Any mitzvah that you do, there's always levels to get reward. So for example, let's say you're, two people are giving $10 to charity. These two people can get completely different rewards for it. One of them can get reward times a thousand of what the other one is getting. Because there's just so many factors that are coming into play over here. What was the day that this person had? What was the day that this person had? What was the, you know, the idea of, you know, maybe this person was in a very bad mood. And maybe this person has you know, $10 million in the bank and this person has only $10 in the bank. So there's many different ideas and that all comes into, uh, you know, into, into the fact over here. I'm sorry, can you just uh, pick up that? If that's uh, on the Gemara, it shouldn't be on the floor. Thank you. So, uh, the, you know, the, when you, there's so many different factors that come, thank you, that come into play when you're going and when you're doing a good deed. Now, if you have two options, so you do, you do it, you know, let's say you give charity, you give $10, and you really wanted to give more. You really wanted to give more. You have a lot more that you wanted, whatever it is that you want to do. God has two options of giving you the reward now. Giving you what you actually did, what you actually gave, or what you really wanted to give. So God could go, thank you. means that God gives you the reward as if of what you really wanted to do it. The remnants of the zimah, the remnants, the, the prayer that you really wanted, if you, if you really wanted to give a good prayer, and unfortunately you didn't, but God's going to give you the prayer that you really wanted it. Why? Because you really wanted it. Where did this all start with? This all started with Abraham. This all started with Abraham. How do we know of Abraham? So we look at Abraham, Abraham over here, and... Um, this story is a very interesting, uh, very interesting story. When you look at it, Abraham goes to Yitzhak and says, come, uh, we're, going on a, you know, we're going on a road trip, right? And Yitzhak goes and you know, he gets put on an altar. And he's about to get slaughtered. And God goes over to you know, Abraham and he says, Abraham, Abraham. He says, don't, don't, uh, um, you know, don't touch, the, don't touch the, the lad, don't touch the young man. And you know, Abraham was like, are you sure? Like, we're already here, you know, we've gone this far, we can just, you know, like, uh, well, he didn't say that, but I'm saying like, you know, Abraham was already there, he was already able, able to do it. And imagine a scenario when God will tell you like, you know what, okay, you don't have to do it. Most people will be like, okay, cool, grabs his hot and books out of there, like runs as fast without even looking back before anybody changes their mind. God changes their mind once, let's leave it at that. Think of this scenario. Now this, I'm, uh, this is not the halakha, this is, you know, don't think about it. Imagine someone comes over, an old, sweet old lady comes over to you, and you know, she's with her walker, and she has a bag over there from Macy's or whatever, a Bloomingdale's, I don't know, pick your choice. And she's like, excuse me, you know, darling, he says, you know, my granddaughter just gave me this gift of a purse. He says, I don't need this purse. He says, what am I going to do with it? He says, you want it? I'll give it to you for $100. And you look inside, you see it's a Chanel bag. Um, as per my wife tells me, it's not cheap. 
right? It's definitely more than hundred dollars. I don't know, five thousand. I don't know, seven thousand. Whatever it is, right? Uh, you know, something. You know, uh, you know, a lot more than hundred. Now, you have two options. You could, you know, be like, you know, listen, you know, it's really worth a lot more than that. You really not do that. Or, unfortunately, what many people would do would be like, a hundred dollars. I have 50. Is 50 going to work for you? And you go 50, and then you run as fast as you can, and you never return to that place in the face, you know, as long as you live, you, you know, that's it. You got a Chanel, you know, you got, you got, you got a like 99% off bag. You know, from that, you're just going to, you're going to run off. Now, I'm not saying that's a halakha. We're not going to the halakha aspect of it. But when God tells Abraham Abinu, he says, you don't have to slaughter Yitzhak anymore. Abraham should have been okay, good, awesome, and let's go. Let's get out of here. But Abraham did not do that. He starts looking around, and then he sees another ayil achel. He sees another ram. And by the way, the satan, the, the, you know, the satan went and he put the ayil in, amongst thorns. As if he's like, no, I don't want Avraham Zivino to, to get this mitzvah. I'd be like, you know, dude, satan, you know, like, he just was about to sacrifice his son. Like, why do you care so much about another ram? Like, what is that going to be? Over there? And then, then what happens is Avraham takes the ram, puts it on the mizbeach, slaughters it, and then another, you know, the, the angel comes out and tells him, and he says, ah, because you did this for me, the pasuk goes on and gives him a slew of full of blessings of what Abraham Avinu did now because he did it. So the question that Rav Shulim Pinchas asks is, I don't understand. He says, when Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, no blessing. All of a sudden he was going to sacrifice a ram, he gets a slew of all blessings. What's changed all of a sudden? So we have to understand, when Abraham Avinu was going to do this, this significant test, he was going to go and he's going to sacrifice his son. He was going to, by the way, you know, this is, the, the, the whole Akitati Yitzhak is a very, very big deal on Rosh Hashanah. We actually laid this in the, the Torah. It's a, it's a very big deal that we're dealing with on, on Rosh Hashanah. So when, when Yitzhak was going to go, and he was going to go and he was going to be sacrificed, when Abraham Avinu was going to sacrifice his only son, <coughs> maybe he did it out of fear. Maybe he was scared of God. I mean, like he was talking to God, you know, like maybe he was scared, like what's going to happen? And that's why he did it. How do we know that Abraham Avinu did it out of love rather than out of fear? Now, what's the difference? What is the difference if you do something out of love or if you do something out of fear? So think of this, uh, you know, this idea. If somebody goes and does a sin and then he does tshuva, there's two ways, two, uh, we'll, 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 you know, make it very, very basic. Two basic ways to do tshuva. Out of fear and out of love. What's the difference? If you do out of fear, so now the tshuva at best is going to go away. Or, you know, maybe it'll go from a mezit to a shogeg, whatever, different opinions, but at best it's going to go away, your, tshuva, your, your sin is going to disappear. So if, God forbid, someone ate a cheeseburger, now, you know, you did tshuva out of fear, no more cheeseburger. But let's say you do tshuva out of love. You do tshuva out of love, which means you're, you're so much in love with God, and you're like, I can't believe I did this. You're, you have that strong connection to God, and that's why you're doing the tshuva, then it changes it completely. The cheeseburger turns into a shloimi's, you know, Danish, and you made the bracha with all the Kabbalistic intentions, and you are modest, well, you, like everything on the highest, highest of levels. It turns the sin to a mitzvah. Now, I do have to say, do not try this at home. Do not be like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to go eat a bunch of cheeseburgers, and then I'm going to draw out of love, and I'll, you know, I'll be fine. This is an idea, you know, do not try this at, in a home situation. This is after the fact. But you're going, and if you do, you see the difference. If you do chuba out of love, it turns the sin into a merit. If you do chuba out of fear, it turns it from a sin to, uh, to nothing at, at best. So, this is also very interesting, that if you're a type of person, the Satan has all your sins, right? It's carrying bags and bags of your sins, right? Some people just one bag, some people many bags, carrying all your sins. Now, if you're a type of person that serves God out of love, so the Satan's going to be like, should I bring this up to God or not? You know, like it's a big risk for him. Because if you do two out of love, he's going to be like, well, look at all the sins. And God's going to be like, well, look, he just did out of love. So yeah, yeah, give that to me. Put it on the other scale. You know, that goes on. Thing. It's a bad bet for the Satan. But if you do two out of fear only, so then the Satan says, what's the worst that I can happen? All right, so, you know, I lose, I lose, I lose everything. But I don't, I don't, I don't you know, I don't, he doesn't get any, any reward for it. So how do we know that Avraham Avinu did the, this mitzvah out of love? And the answer is, is you could all see what he did after he finished it. After God told him, you don't have to sacrifice Yitzchak. He could have just left. If he would have left, he would have gotten the reward. But he did, he did it out of fear. But now what he does, he says, no, he says, I came so far, I want to sacrifice to God. I want to do something for God. He says, I can't leave here without sacrificing. He turns around, he sees another ram. The Satan puts the ram in the thorns. You know why? He says, the Satan says, I can't have him take this ram. This, is, this shows that everything that he did is out of love. Everything that he did out of love, that brings it up to such another higher level. He says, that I cannot have. What happens is, is we come, and you know why, why it says that, the, that Yitzchak, the ashes of Yitzchak is under God's, uh, under God's glory, uh, the, you know, Kisei Because it is. 
Because God considers it as if He did it because He did it out of love. And if He did it, if He really wanted to do something, if you really want to do something, but it's beyond your capabilities, your abilities to do it, you get reward for what you did. And He says, so you do have it. So we're blowing the shofar because the shofar what shows, the ram is what shows that everything happened out of love. We don't put an ISIS knife. We don't build them as bath. We don't do anything else, but we, build, we put the shofar. Because the shofar shows that everything is out of love. Comes Rosh Hashanah. We're blowing the shofar. We're reminding ourselves, we're reminding God in the day of judgment. He says, look at what our essence is. Our essence is that we do things out of love. We don't do things out of fear. We have such a strong connection to you. We have such a strong power to you. And this is, what, this is the power that we're dealing with over here. So now, this is all very nice and dandy. But what about most of us? Do most of us serve God out of love? I don't know. Most of us, you know, they, they hear about... Why don't, why don't, give me a second. Yeah. Most of us... You know, I get a lot of people that, that are in the Baruch Hashem, get a lot of people that are, are in the tshuva process. But why do they do tshuva? God took away their money, they don't have a shidduch, they don't have this. That's not serving God out of love, that's serving God out of fear. Again, it's great, you should do it. Like, keep on doing it. But, it's not like some, you know, like, unfortunately, a lot of people, where do they come all of a sudden to, where, where do people, you know, there's a class that I, that I give, that, how did it start with? It started with, because one guy got murdered. One of their friends got murdered, got shot, it got, you know, got, you know, got murdered. And because of that, they started a, they started a class. And, uh, you know, so it's great. They started a class because of it. But it was because of the fear. Because they all of a sudden woke up. They're like, hey, listen, this 20-something-year-old kid just, got, just died one, you know, one Shabbat day. You know, out of the, nothing. So, like, they, they, started a whole, they started a whole class in memory of him. But it comes, this stems out of fear. It doesn't stem out of, you know what? I just made $7 million. Let's, let's you know, I, I want to just become religious all of a sudden. You know, like, it, there, there's two different aspects of it. So how do we know? Like deep down, we know that um, maybe we could say we want to do it out of love, but how, how, do, how do we connect to that? How do we get to that? So now, let me share with you something from Hashem Shem Pincus. You know that every mitzvah, every, every commandment that we have, has a spiritual power to it. So you look, let's say for example, the tzitzit. The tzitzit has a power, you, you, you look at it and you remember it. It has, it has a special power. What is the spiritual power of the shofar? The spiritual power of the shofar is something very interesting. It has the power to break open things that are hidden. If something is broken, it's hidden inside, the shofar has the ability to blast it open into, into the hidden. This is why, if you realize, when was the first, when we have shofar, when the Torah was given. The Torah was created 974 generations before the world was created. It was hidden. When was it revealed? On Hal Sinai, 3,300 years ago, roughly. What was it revealed with? With the shofar. Why? Because the shofar breaks through the open. That's why when Mashiach comes, it's going to break through the era of Mashiach, it's going to be with the time with the shofar. Resurrection, it's, break, it's taking things from the hidden, and it's bringing it into the revealed. That is the power of the, of the shofar. Now we have a very, very interesting halakha, that we're not really able to practice it, you know, per se these days. And that is the halakha of divorce. If let's say a man does not want to divorce his wife, his wife wants to get a get, and he doesn't want to divorce it, there's halakha the Rambam brings down in Hilchot Gerushin chapter 2. He says that we, the, the Bedin has the ability to compel him to divorce him. To, to, com- to force the man to divorce his wife. Now the question is, is that how, if you force someone to do something, it's not, let's say you force someone to sell you something. That's not a good sale. He doesn't actually really want to sell it to you. That's, you know, there's an avak of geneva. There's a dust of, of, of stealing over there because he doesn't really want to sell it to you. So how could it be things that divorce is a, is a big thing? If you don't, if there's, you know, and unfortunately, you know, in the, in the, in the tshuva age of Baruch Hashem, actually, in the tshuva age that we're dealing with right now, there's a lot of questions. Let's say, you know, like, people got married in Russia or something like that and they weren't religious and then they're coming back into America and they get divorced but they get civilly divorced or something like that they don't get actually and now they go and she gets married to somebody else does that divorce count? you realize that if it doesn't if you know that this could be a, a status of a married woman being with and that all their kids are going to be moms there and it's, it's, a, it's a very very serious you know situation but when you realize it like the Rabbi I'm saying over here we force somebody who doesn't want to go and divorce his wife, we force him to divorce it, and it's still going to be a good divorce. Now the question is how? How is that good? Says the Raman, because deep down, deep down, for some people, deep, 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 deep down, really, really deep down, but everybody deep down really wants to do good. Some people are deeper than others, but everybody wants to do good. Says, but we're getting him to do good, like, it's not something that he's being forced to do. He really wants to do it. He just needs a little bit of an extra push in order to get to it. So everybody really wants to, to do good and sometimes they need the extra push over there. There's a Gemara in Barachot, page 17a. 
that says that, that you know there was a Rabbi Alexandria that after he prayed he would say he would say like this to God. It says it's it's revealed and known to you that we all want to serve you. We really want every Jew wants to be a good Jew. He says, but what's stopping us? See, uh, the the yeast in the dough and the shibud malchus. We have the satan and the subjugation of the nations that is preventing us from serving you the way that we want to. So deep down, what do we see? Deep down, every single Jew wants to do good. Every single person deep down wants to do good. Some people it's really dead down, but it's deep down. The shofar, we said, has the ability to break open the things that are hidden. To break out the things. The shofar in Rosh Hashanah has the power to break down that deep down, what's really deep down inside of you, that really need to do good. The shofar has the ability to break it open and, and, uh, uh, and, and bring it into fruition. This is something very interesting also what we say before we blow the shofar. We say, Min keratika. He says, from the narrow straits I, I, I call upon God. Anani but God ends me, answers me from the, from the wide straight. If you realize the shofar, you have to blow it from the narrow hole and it comes out from the wide hole. Why? Because the narrow represents things that are hidden. The wide are things that are open. You're taking, by blowing the shofar, you're taking things that are hidden inside of you. What's hidden inside of you? The desire and the want to only do the best and only be the best Jew possible. That's what's hidden inside of you. The shofar has the ability to break all that open and bring it open. I mean, I that will make me answer you, God, in the, in the, wide, in the wide expanse. This is the idea behind the, you know, behind the shofar. And even furthermore, every holiday has a spiritual energy in, in itself. We know, for example, let's say um, Pesach. And the exodus of Egypt was a redemption. It's not just a redemption. If you realize, the, the power of the holidays is not just what it was 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. Every single year, the same power lies in itself. And every single year, for example, on, on Pesach, you have the ability to be redeemed from your own problems. You have the ability to do that. What is the power of Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah, we were created. The power that we have on Rosh Hashanah is to be recreated. To come again to what we really need to be, to come again to the place that we need to be. This is how we think and how we understand the Tkiah. We started off with the Tkiah. There's going to be one long sound because God says, this is how I created you. But now Shvarim, you broke it up. You broke up your soul. But through the Tkiah, through the Tkiah, you're going to get back to the Tkiah. You're going to get back because you're going to go, we're going to break you through and we're going to see what's actually in deep inside inside of you and you're going to be able to go and, uh, and, uh, and free you from your restraints and actually get you to the, to the person that you want to be. There's an idea there, Absurdus because goes on and says further. So far, so good? You had a question like seven hours ago, right? You still mm-hmm. have the question? Okay, so the, the idea we have to go and now and answer is regarding the, the coronation. So what is the coronation? Like we're blowing the shofar, it's God's coronation. What, what does that have to do with that or anything? So the, w- when a king gets coronated, so there's trumpets that sound, but there's also more that the king does. The king gets paraded through town and the king usually throws out like gold coins, you know, and the people pick up the gold coins and they say, long live the king. They scream, long live the king. <coughs> so imagine the king is walking out one time and instead of throwing gold coins, he's throwing out diamonds. And, you know, people, you know, would, you know, you pick up the diamonds. But imagine somebody does not pick up the diamonds. That's a chutzpah. That's a disgrace to the king. It says, God, you know, the king is throwing out diamonds here. You're not picking up. Says Rav Shimshon Pinkus. He says, Rosh Hashanah, the time that's coming up right now is God's coronation. And God is throwing out diamonds to everybody. We have the ability during these times. You have from Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. You have all this time. You have the ability to gain so many merits. There's like so many mitzvot. There's a spiritual power in this world that you could get to where you always wanted to get over here. But if you're not picking up those diamonds, if you're not working on yourself, if you're not doing the tshuva, if you're not doing, pick, taking it by yourself, those extra mitzvot, then you're, it's like that king who's throwing the diamonds and you're like, whatever, I'm good. You know, I don't need it. It's a, it's a disgrace to the king. There was once, um, there was once a, a, a king that had a very, very far away province. And in order to have a good rule on the province, he had to set certain criteria. And he set policemen, and he set judges, and he sent soldiers over there. And one, uh, you know, one particular you know, time, there was a you know, person that went and you know, he violated one of the, one of the sins, uh, one of the violations over there, and he was brought in front of the judge. And the judge, you know, according to the letter of the law, he had to sentence him to a very, very serious decree, very, very serious uh, um, you know, sentence. And the guy started begging, goes on his knees and says, please, my dear judge, I'm begging of you. I have a family, I have kids, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. Goes and he begs and he begs and he begs and he begs. And the, king, and the judge says, what can I do? He says, it's out of my control. He says, I'm following the king's orders. He says, if I let you go, he says, the whole place is going to fall apart. The whole place is going to go, I can't, what can I do? I can't do anything about it. And he had to go and he had to sentence him. A short while later, the king comes visiting this faraway province. And this guy in prison hears about it, he begs, he, he's like, I need, I need to see the king. I need to see the king. And he goes in front of the king. And he goes and he starts begging. He says, the king, you could do anything. He says, I beg you, I have a family, I have you know, this, I'm so sorry what I did. Please grant me clemency. The king looks at him, reviews the case, and he says, you know what, I grant you clemency. 
the ministers go over to the king and says, listen, you can't do this. He says, you know, what's going to be if, you know, the next guy, it's going to ruin the whole system. The king says, as long, as long as I'm around, the system doesn't matter. He says, I can control the system. I manipulate the system. I can do whatever I want. No one's messing around when the king is in town. No one's is messing around. The, when, when we're going, and we're going every single day, we're doing sins, we're doing mitzvot, we're doing things, God judges us. We're right, we're, there's judgment that's always, that, that is always happening throughout our lives. And it gets judged through a particular you know, way, a sort, set of, of laws. But when God is in town, when God is being coronated, the laws can be bent. The laws are, have the ability to go and bend. God says, I'm in town, I'm getting coronated now. I can decide, I want to bend the rules, I want to change the rules, I can do whatever I want, uh, but it has to go according to the laws. It's not when I'm in town. When I'm in town, when I'm around, anything goes. And no one's going to go a step out of whack. Says Rav Shimshon Pinkus. He says, think of this idea over here. He says that, imagine a boy comes home. And um, the boy, you know, gets a phone, the, the, the parents get a phone call from the teachers. He says, boy, oh, he was such a terrible kid today. You know, he lit the school on fire. Uh, you know, he threw darts at the professor while he was back with it. Like, you know, like the serious stuff, right? Nowadays, it will be a big problem because nowadays the teacher will be like, you know, we're going to sue you. It's your fault somehow. You know, it's not our boy's fault. You know, all he does is plays, you know, war games all day. There's no reason why he should actually, you know, be like this. But back in the days when Parents used to discipline their kids, right? What would be happen, you know, if, you know, ch- you know, 30 years ago, a child came home and, you know, the, the teacher called and says, hey, listen, you know, you're, you know, you, you know, the teacher says that you stayed in the bathroom too long, you know, whatever, like something, you know, like, you, you know, you, you made a funny, you know, remark. The, the father is going to sit over there. There's going to be steam coming out of his ears and his nose. He's going to be, you know, he's going to be like, going to be ready to pounce. The mother is, you know, sitting there with his belt, you know, like this, you know, like, you know, and, um, you, you know, you have over there, the grandparents are sitting there with a cowboy whistle. You know, the whole family is going on at him, and he is going, he knows it's going down. I mean, like, this kid could be, you know, like seven, eight years old. This kid knows it's going down. Like, and, you know, the father goes over to him, and he says, you know, your teacher called. And the kid's, you know, he's dying to, you know, and he's like thinking over here. And the father says, you go upstairs into your room, we'll be right with you, you know. And he's sitting over there, and he's like, he's like, okay, that's it, my life is over, you know, you know, I gotta go say goodbye to all my friends because I'm never gonna see them. You know, that, that that's it. You know, like you think, the, you know, that it's the end of time. Now imagine he goes up, and he's not thinking because he's all, you know, upset. And you know, he's, you know, he, he has a very, very heavy door in his room, and he accidentally closes the door on his little finger, and he lets out this shofar sound, all the shofar sounds, all hundred sounds he lets out over there. The father, the mother, they hear, they run upstairs. They see the door is closed, his finger is still like hanging over there. They open the door and he is doing the toa, you know, he's doing all the shofar. He's crying and crying and crying and crying over there. They, you know, they're going, they're bandaging it and they're going over here. Do we go, need to go to the hospital? I don't know, look at it, do you need stitches? I don't know how you know, tell you, do you need stitches, right? You know, there's always the story of the parents. Or how deep is that? I don't know, it's bleeding, I can't tell. You know, and you're going over there, I don't know, just put duct tape around it, right? You know, so you're going over there and you're, you're, you're going and the parents are going and they're screaming and they're crying and they're going back and forth, back and forth. And finally, the kid finally relaxes. What is the first thing that the father tells him? He says, what prize do you want? He says, well, get you. You want a new Xbox, a new PlayStation? What do you want? You know, all of us, what changed? Four minutes ago, you were going to murder him. He was going to be the Akedat Yitzchak. You were going to sacrifice him. All, all of a sudden, one thing, one shofar sound, and that's it. Everything changes. All of a sudden, everything changes. The ideas over here and how things can change in an instant is so unbelievable. Yeah, I'll share with you something that I probably shouldn't share online, but I will. <laughs> So, um, thanks, this is personal, it happened to me, that um, about five years ago, I was, you know, me and my family, we were visiting, um, we were visiting family out, you know, in the, in the Hamptons, and um, it was some sort of big sale day. And, you know, my wife, uh, well, the truth is, like any Jew, you know, you see a sale, you're required halakhically to go. Um, you know, otherwise you violate a, you know, a biblical commandment on not saving money. So, um, it's, there was a place called there, it was called Hanger Outlets. It's, the amount of people that were there, they were unbelievable. I'm like, what are people doing here? No one's Jews over here. Like, why is it so, so big? But it was unbelievable. There were so many people going on over there. There were so many, like, tons and tons and tons. And um, at that time, I had, uh, you know, it, it was, I had a daughter and I had a son. And uh, my son was about two years old. And my son, you know, he liked to investigate what's going on around. He didn't like to just stay where, you know, you are, you know. So 
always have to go and always have to hold them, always have to hold on them. And every few minutes, would be like, no, you have to stay over here. You know, you have to go and tell them very strictly. You have to stay with that. You know, stay with that, but you have to go over here, stay with mommy. It, you know, very, very strict. And um, so we were in the store. I'll tell you what store it was. It was called Wilson Weather, Leathers. Wilson Leathers. Still remember that. I remember all the details to this day. Uh, my wife was looking at some coats, so I took my daughter and we were walking, you know, I was walking around. I thought my wife has my son. And, you know, she apparently thought I had the son. Well, whatever. So, we're walking around. And um, my wife would probably not be happy that I'm saying the story. But, okay. So, uh, <laughs> I have to ask her before I post it if I'm able to do it. So, if it goes online, you know that my wife gave the okay on it. So, um, the... So now when, when uh, you know, we, you know we're, we're going, you know, I was going on this side, she was going on that side, uh, you know, whatever, you know, what am I going to do in that I store? Like store? I, 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 walk, I, I walk over to, you know, I walk over to her side and, and I'm looking around, I'm like, you know, where's, where's the boy? And she's like, oh, I thought you had him. And I'm like, no, I thought you had him. <laughs> and there was a, I don't know, my heart that sort of just like left its place, <laughs> went all the way down to my heel then went down up to my head and then bounced around all you know a few little places is I was going out of my mind I was going it's it's a place that there's so there's thousands of people over there I'm the first, I grab my kid I run outside and I'm like you know and I'm uh, like I'm like screaming his name I'm like you know I'm screaming his name I'm running back and forth back and forth I'm going all over the place I'm like, did you see a little kid, yay high, blonde hair, blue eyes? I'm like, did you see him? And, you know, like, and I'm screaming at everybody. I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm, pe- I'm, pe- I'm, I'm like, stay over here. You tell me if you see. Like, I'm posting. I'm, I'm, I was beyond myself. I'm telling you, I was honest. Because what I did is I went outside. I took a look at what was going on over there. And I thought about the worst. And I thought about the worst. And I was like, you know. And the first thing, you know, so there were so many different emotions that were going inside of me. Like, how could he do this? How could he run away? I mean, he's two. Of course he's going to run away. But the first thing is like, oh, how could you do this? You know, why are you just not staying next to your parents? It's upset. It's anger. Oh, am I going to show up? But, you know, like, we're going, I'm running back and forth. I'm running outside. The, what probably was two minutes felt like 17 hours. And my wife is running throughout the entire store. I come back into the store after I'm running outside. I, I quickly, you know, scanned the entire thing. I didn't see anything over there. I quickly ran back inside the store. I see that he's climbing through the, the coats over there. He's like not even going through the aisles anymore. He's like hiding in the actual clothing sections. You know, and he's like going, you know, he's like zigzagging through it. I run over there. I pick him up and I just hug him. And I hug him and I don't say anything to him. And I don't tell him, next time stay with Abba. No, I don't say anything. I just hold him. And for the rest of the day, I held him. And I was <laughs> sore for about another week, you know, because I was holding him for the entire day. Why? Because you get so scared. God forbid, who knows what could happen. You know, I wish this upon no one. No one should ever feel this. What God forbid it is to, feel, to, to lose a child, even for a second. What this feeling that a parent feels like, I wish it on nobody. But imagine that feeling that you finally found that you don't care about anything. I don't care that you ran away. I don't care that you took a stapler and you stapled my pants together. I really, do, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm just going to hold you and I don't care. That's all I want is I just want to hold you. When God comes, this is what the power of the shofar. The power of the shofar is is that we're going and we're broken. And we're going over there and we're, we're, we're about to be sentenced to such judgment. But all of a sudden there's a shofar. And there's that scream, and that's a scream that comes from inside of us. That's a scream of showing us, and God says, I don't care about anything anymore. He says, I just want to hold you. I, says, I just want to be with you. I, ju- I just want this. And this is what the power of the shofar has. The power of the shofar has the power to break that with inside. Why does it have the power? Because it's on k- the king's coronation. On the king's coronation, it got, the, there's no rules. God could manipulate the rules as much as he wants. This is the power that we have on, on Rosh Hashanah with the power of the shofar. The Kedushat Levi goes and says like this. It says, the Pasuk in Tehilim, chapter 98, verse 6. It says, He says, he says on this Pasuk, he says there was once a king who went on a hunting expedition. And uh, while on his hunting expedition, he got lost. He got, you know, he got removed from his, from his crew and he got lost. And he was lost for quite some time and he didn't actually look like a king anymore. And he went over to one of the hunters and he says, please, I'm begging you, I'm the king. He says, can you please guide me back to the right place? Bring me to the right place, you'll be heavily rewarded. So the hunters looked at him and be like, yeah, sure, you're the king, I'm the queen, you know, you know please, you know, you know, get out of my face. You know, I'm not interested in this. And he goes for the king goes from one place to another and no one's interested in it. Everyone's saying get lost. Finally, he finds some one kind-hearted, you know, hunter. And he says, uh, he says, you know, it exists. Uh, and he says, um, you know, please, can you guide me back to the, to the, I'm the king, you know, I'm the king. And the hunter looks at him and says, yeah, sure, no problem. 
he takes them by his hand and they start skipping. No, I mean, they go and they start and they and they and he guides them back to the you know to the kingdom and he says, Here's the king. The king says, Thank you so much. He says, I want you to come in. And he heavily rewarded him and he gave him he gave him clothing that befits somebody that goes and saves the king. A short while later, this guy got you know convicted for some sort of felony that he did, a pretty serious felony, and he was gonna get a judge in front of the king. And he said, listen, I'll go in front of the king, but of course, you know, I don't have any choice, but I have one request. I want to wear a particular pair of clothing. And the judge, you know, says, you know, do whatever you want, you know, whatever you And he goes and he wears the clothing that the king gave him for saving his life. He walks into the courtroom, the king is sitting there and all this majesty, you know, sitting over there, he's going to judge the case. He sees the guy that saves his life with all his robes and all his, you know, things that, you know, he remembers what he did for him. The key, he just walks up and there and says, dismiss, this guy is good, he's scot-free, don't worry about it. And this he says that says says uh, um, Rav Levi Yitzchak Berdichev. He says in Kedusha Slavi. He says when all when God went over to all the nations of the world. He says, "Do you want my Torah?" They were like, "Well, what's inside of it?" And then they said, "No." And then he went from one nation to another nation to another nation to another nation. Every single one said no. He went over to the Jewish people. He says, "You want my Torah? Nah, seven Ishma. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll take it." And what happened after that? The Kol Shofar Gadol. There was a great you know shofar sound. Now says, says the Kedusha Levi, comes the judgment day. Comes the judgment day, and we're, what's happening over here? All the nations of the world did not want to take the Torah. We took the Torah, and we have a responsibility. We have more you know, things upon, upon ourselves. But what did we do? We take the shofar. The shofar is that, that, that clothing. He says, yeah, God, we, we took the Torah, and we messed up. Yeah, we did mess up. But remember where we were. We were the only ones that accepted this. We were the ones that saved. We were the ones that guided the king back to the palace. We were the ones that were willing to take the bait. So it says the Kedush Levi, this is what we blow the shofar. This is what reminds us and reminds God, reminds the judgment on this holy particular day. Now we can understand the power of the shofar. We can understand why we had so many people sacrifice so much for the shofar. There was a rabbi by the name of Rabbi uh, Tzvi Hirsch and Maizel. He, uh, he went through the Holocaust and... Um, when, you know, I believe it was 1944, where he was able to somehow smuggle in a shofar on Rosh Hashanah. And what he did was, is that he went from place to place, for as much as he was able to do, to go and blow the shofar for those, uh, for those people. All hundred sounds, unbelievable that he was able to do, you know, able to do that. Because again, if the Nazis find out that he's blowing a shofar, they're not going to be like, alright, give it to me. You're not getting this back until after recess. That's not what's happening in, in the Holocaust, right? If they get caught doing something like that, that's like death you know, at best, you know, or torture or other things. So he was risking his life. He's going and, he's, and he was, was blowing the shofar for, you know, for many people. He's going around from place to place. And then he found out that, you know, in, in Auschwitz, there were, there were people that had to be transported, you know, at times there would be hundreds or even thousands of people that would be transferred to labor camps for days here or, you know, days over here. And there were a certain group of people that were not in their normal, you know, bunks that they were able to hear the shofar. So they begged him, can you please do it again for us? And every time that he did it was another sacrifice. It was, it was another like, you know, you know, scary thing that he had to go through. And he went in total, he went with him and his son, he did it for a total of 20 times. 20 times in that day he went and he blew the shofar. Then he gets, you know, you know the, there's, there's a group of 1,400 boys that hear that he has a shofar. And they go and they call him. They couldn't go out. They go, they go, they send them a message. If you could keep, please come in. And um, they go and they were in this particular bunk. They were going to be sent to the crematorium. Which means that they were going to send to their deaths. They were going to be burned to death. And they said, you know, please, can you, can you please blow the shofar for us? So, the, you know, the way that the rabbi was able to do it, you know, through bribing, he was able to go and, and convince, you know, the, the cop, you know, the, the, you know, the officer was there, you know, don't do it, whatever. He was able to go. He goes over to the officer in charge of this, you know, of this, uh, you know, section. And he says, can you let me go inside over there for a little bit? And the officer, you know, obviously took the bribe. And he said, listen, I'll let you go inside. He says, but if I hear sirens, if I hear anybody else coming you're staying in here with them. Which means is your end is going to be the end with them because you're not coming back out of here. So he's going back and forth. Should I do it? Should I not do it? His son, who is with him, this rabbi's son, says, you know, you know Father, you don't have to do this. This is already, you're going too far already. You, this is not an obligation. And he was going back and forth and he writes the story himself and he says, you know, he says, halakhically, I probably shouldn't have done it because you're not supposed to risk your life for, you know, for the, the level that I had to do, I, I did not have to do it. He says, but I made a calculation. He says, you know, in Auschwitz, there are people that are around today and they're not around tomorrow. He says, what, what, what am I going to stick around for this? He says, there are 1,400 boys that were crying and begging for me to blow the shofar. How could I say no to them? And he, and he stationed his son outside, and he says, and he goes, and he bribed the, the officer, and he goes inside. He goes, and, you know, he was, he was about to blow the shofar, and the boy said, you know, before you blow, can you say a few words to us? You know, what can you say to 1,400 boys that are being led to their death? 
And he said whatever he could that he, that he say, and then he went and he blew the shofar. He blew the shofar, and uh, you know, one of the boys, right after they finished blowing the shofar, stood up, and he started screaming, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And 1,400 boys together all said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, all together. And then as the rabbi was about to leave, one kid stands up, and you know, he hushes everybody. He says, he says you know, we're not going to tell thank you to the rabbi for what he did. We're not going to tell the rabbi, thank you for risking your life, for giving us the last possible mitzvah of the shofar that we can have. He says, but what we will do is something else. He says, I'm going to give a rabbi a blessing. He says that because in merit of all this, he says, may the rabbi be able to go and escape out of, you know, get, get alive out of, out of Auschwitz. And 1,400 boys scream, Amen. And the rabbi left. As the rabbi was leaving, a few boys went and tugged on his coat and says, you know, rabbi, today is Rosh Hashanah. He says, we haven't eaten in 24 hours. He says, we're not supposed to be fed. The boy said, you know, thought we're not supposed to fast on Rosh Hashanah. Can you, can you please give us some food so we can break our fast so we don't have to fast on Rosh Hashanah? The rabbi said, what am I supposed to do? I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have anything. And, you know, and he, he wasn't able to give it anything. And the rabbi goes on and says, you know, and the boys still fasting went into their, you know, went into their final moments, into the deaths in the crematorium. May God, you know, avenge their, avenge their souls. He says, look at what he went and he sacrificed. And by the way, this rabbi ended up getting out of the Holocaust. He ended up surviving, he ended up going to Chicago, became a big rabbi in Chicago as well. But we see what people, the power of the shofar, what people risk their lives for the shofar, there's so much to it, more to it, that we just think it's just sounds and noises. There was a, uh, you know, a, you know in, the, in the Spanish Acquisition, there was a person by the name of Don Fernando Aguilar. So in the Spanish Acquisition, uh, uh, um, there was a, um, the way that the Jews, unfortunately, so, so to just explain, when King Fernando and, uh, or Fernanda and Queen Isabella, when they, when they sort of captured the majority of Spain, they decided that everybody's going to be Christian. And the Jews had options. Well, technically not really. But the, their, their options was run. Run like you've never run before. And that's what some Jews did. They took whatever possessions they can and they just left. They, you, people had businesses. People had houses. People had buildings. People had mansions. They just left everything and left because you couldn't be a Jew anymore. There were some people that still decided they want to be Jews and they ended up going to their deaths because of it. And there are some people that end up becoming something that's called Muranos. Muranos were people that went and... and Pretended to be Christian outside, but inside they were still Jews. By the way, does anybody know what Moranos means? Pigs. Pigs. Yeah, it's a very derogatory uh, you know, term. So, this Don Fernando Aguilar, he was a Morano. He was a Jew in heart, but outside he, was, he pretended to be Christian. He was a very wealthy, um, he was uh, you know, in charge of a, he was like a conductor of a musical you know, symphony. He was a very, very wealthy, well to do, high prestige in uh, you know, Spain during that time. And, you know, so how do the Jews over there, how do they practice Judaism? The only way that they could practice Judaism is the little things. They couldn't, they couldn't gather together and read Torah. They couldn't, because if they, they found out about it, they would be, so they would be able to pray in their homes, in secret, and hiding. But a shofar sound? Forget about it. There's no way that you could do a shofar sound during the, you know, during the time of the Spanish Inquisition. So, this uh, Don Fernando Aguilar, what he decided one time is five years after the Spanish Inquisition came into you know, effect when the Jews weren't able to practice Judaism, he goes and he decides, he puts out advertisement. He says, I'm going to make the most amazing symphony, the most amazing orchestra that anybody has ever seen before. This is going to combine all music from all parts of the world. There's going to be all different types of instruments. There's going to be from all parts of the world, they're going to all go and put one, one like, you know, unified you know, symphony. And the day, the day comes when the, the hall, you know, gets booked, it gets packed to the, to the brim, and, you know, and he goes, and it's true to the saying, there was like things, there were bongos going on over there, there were harps, there were like strings, there, was, there were so many different instruments that he made it sound so beautiful. Then suddenly, in the middle of the show, one person gets up over there in the middle of the thing with a shofar. This just so happens to be, it was a Marana Jew. And this... This shofar, in the middle of the symphony, in the middle of this large orchestra, he goes and he blows a hundred, sho- a hundred tekiot. He blows all the, all the shofar. Now, little did the people know, they just thought it was all part of the nice thing. But he orchestrated it that all the Jews would come to this, uh, you know, to this, uh, to this uh, symphony. So they would be, all be able to be owed to the mitzvah of, of, uh, you know, of shofar. And this happened to happen on September 5th, if I'm not mistaken, 19, uh, 1497, if I'm not mistaken. And this was the first day of Rosh Hashanah, that he went 
And he, yeah, 1497, September 5th. This is the, four, this is the first day of Rosh that he did it. Now, there's a question of how the story actually ended. There's, you know, different opinions that if they actually found him and they actually, you know, did what they did with everybody else or he actually lived out his life. But this is what he sacrificed himself for. What? To do a mitzvah of, of Shofar. You have also the story of Rebbe uh, uh, Esther Youngreis. She went through the Holocaust also and she was one time in a lecture in Israel and she was mentioning how somebody went and was able to smuggle a Shofar by, by like, collecting... 200 cigarettes and you know bargaining with somebody and able to get a shofar they blew the shofar but unfortunately they weren't as lucky as anybody else they caught them and they started beating them because of that and when, after, when she's saying this there was an old woman who, uh, who stood up and she says, she says I know that story he says because that shofar was my father's shofar we have it he says he was the one that blew the shofar and she's like, what? And she's like, yeah. And the woman just ran out of the, out of the lecture hall, comes back a few minutes later with the shofar. She says, this is the shofar. I still have it. And, you know, as, Representative Esther Young writes over the story, and she says, she says me and this, this woman, we held the shofar and we just cried. We just sit there and we cried. It says, you know, there's so many Jews that were lost in the Holocaust. But at the same, time, same point in time, you know, Hitler is also gone. The Nazis are also gone. But you know what's still here? This shofar. This shofar is still over here. And they said they stand over there, they stood over there, they held the shofar and they just cried. It says the Jews risked their life for the shofar. Why? It says because there's so much to it, there's so much power to it. I want to share with you, and we're almost finished over here, I know we're getting a little bit late, so again, the usual announcement, if anybody needs to leave, by all, by all means, you know, feel free. I read this very interesting article by Dr. Yvette Miller. And I want to share with you the science behind the shofar. Something very interesting on what our, our brain does when, when it hears a shofar. So... She goes and, and uh, this doctor goes and explains this. Says, you know, when, when we're subjected to a loud sound, we, we have this, um, this physical change in us, this, uh, this uh, psychological idea of fight or flight. Right? So if anybody's familiar with psychology, we'll probably know what, what, what I'm uh, talking about over here. So she goes and says there's four things that happen to our brain when we hear the chauffeur sound, which is a, large, which is a loud sound, which was bring us to the fight or flight uh, you know, response. Number one, is our senses are sharpened. Number, and she goes and explains like this. It says the hypothalamus in the brain produce hormones <laughs> that, uh, you know, that, that changes our physiological state. There is neuropeptides that, uh, that make us more alert. And that's why when you get scared, you get more alert for a second. You're, like, you, you're able to comprehend things more at, at that time. And there's a decreased need for sleep. You realize if, let's say, you're falling asleep and you hear a noise, you're so tired. You're so tired. You're sleeping alone in the house and then you hear like... You know, and you're like, you know, you're up. Like, you know, you could go to the gym now. Like, you're uh, you're like, you're not sleeping. There's there's something that when the fight, you have your more alertness. You're like alert. You're not tired. There's a decreased need for sleep. You have adrenaline that's going on in here. You have norepinephrine also that's going on over here. Your heart rate starts beating faster. Your you, everything sharpens to a little bit in a little in a little a, a new state of alertness. This is what happens also when you hear the shofar sound. It's a loud sound that happens all suddenly, and all this, all this extra alertness, the, 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 our senses are suddenly sharpened. Number two, our emotions grow stronger. She goes and explains the brain release neurotransmitters that, st- that stimulate part of the brain called the amyg- amygdala. This is, re- this is that relies on emotions rather than on intellectual ideas. Because let's say you're in a situation where it's a fight or flight situation. You can't start thinking of all the possible theoretical ideas. You've got to work fast, and that's based off emotions. So you've got to run, you've got to fight, you've got to do something, and that's, what you, that's based off, off emotions. But this idea, when you think about it in the shofar, it teaches you to be more honestly with yourself. You hear the shofar, you get more alertness, and then you get more in the emotional side of things. And then it's, you become more true to who you actually are. And three is there is the hippocampus in the part of the brain which stores long-term memory gets, gets switched on. Which means is that the brain, when you're in a fight or flight situation, when you're in this situation, the brain wants to make sure you remember this. So you're going to remember the situation, and that's why you'll, you possess it, put it into long-term memory. So the things that we hear, what we're thinking about in rush, in, on, on the shofar, it puts a lasting impact on us as well. And finally, four, our brains become more active. We become more active overall, and this, this, what, what is this so important? So the shofar is a very brief moment that you're hearing the shofar. So everything changes in the physiological state that you're able to comprehend, you're able to accomplish so much more than you would be on a regular state. That's what the noise, that's what a loud noise does to you. And this is what the power of the shofar, in the, even in the, in the physical state, has to do with it. So now, the, the Baal Shem Tov says something like this. says that, that when... You know, a king has many, many, let's say, many rooms in his palace. Each room has another key. So, but there's one where there's like one key that could open any room. And that key is called an axe, right? It can open up any, any single room, no problem. This is what a shofar is. A shofar could break open any single door. It could open up that axe, it's that axe that breaks open any single door. 
But King David, on the other hand, says, Ashrei Ayam Yodea Twa. Fortune is a nation that knows the sound of the Torah, which means is that there's some sort of intellectual idea behind it. There's some sort of, of knowing of, of the shofar. So the question is asked, is the shofar something that is just an emotion, or is it based off the intellect? Is it like an emotion that is just an act? You could just break open any single door, or do you have to have some sort of intellectual ideas behind it? So Dubin Magad goes, and he shares his story to go and explain this. And he says like this, and he says, there was once a poor farmer, and this poor farmer was once invited to his wealthy uncle's, you know, uh, you know, land. He's going to go for a meal. He says, you know, of course, you know, going to the wealthy. And he goes and he goes and he, and he jumps on the, on the invitation. He goes and he sees this huge mansion. He knocks on the door. Servants open up over there. The, the, the uncle goes and welcomes and gives him a hug. And he says, please, he sits down by his table. He's a huge table over there. And they're sitting and they're chatting about the family, you know, you know connecting all the guys, you know, like whatever, you know, family does. Then suddenly, after they're talking for quite some time, he, the poor farmer sees that the wealthy uncle has a little silver bell right on his, on his desk. He takes up the bell, and he gives it a little jingle, he gives it a little ring. And all of a sudden, like four servants comes from the kitchen. And they start like, with like, plates of food. And they start putting food in front of, you know, like food like he's never seen before. And the, farm, you know, the, farmer, the, the wealthy guy goes to the farmer, to his, to his, uh, his uh, family, and says, yeah, but please, you know, behavet, you know, join me for the meal. And this farmer is eating like he never ate before. He says, I've never seen so much food. Then suddenly they're talking a little bit more. Suddenly the wealthy guy picks up the bell again and he shakes the bell again. Four servants come back in. They take off all the, you know, all the food. They bring it out. The guy's like, this is unbelievable. You know, a few minutes later, the guy picks up the bell, shakes it again. Comes a second course. This is a seven course meal this is happening. This farmer is going out of his mind. They finish the long, the long conversation. He says, thank you. And he, go, and he starts heading back home. But before he heads back home, he goes to the local you know, silver store. And he says, and he looks and he finds the exact same bell that his, fa- that his uncle has. He buys it. He takes all the money he has and he buys that bell. He takes the bell. He gets home in the middle of the night. He goes to his wife and he starts waking her up. You know, he's like, Ethel! You know, I've, he's like, he starts waking her up and he says, you're not going to believe what I got. And he says, what did you get? What did you get? He says, I spent our last savings on, on it, but don't, it's, it's life-changing. And he shows her a little bell. And she's like, you know, she's like, well, I'm going on. You know, like, and she's like, what do you mean? Why did you spend all this money with this? What's going on over here? He says, ha, ha, ha. He says you don't know anything about this. He says, watch. They, he brings her outside in the middle of the night. They sit on their little wooden bench. They wipe off all the spiders. They sit down on the bench over there. He puts the bell over there. And he's like, so, how was your day? And he's like, she's like, listen, it's midnight. What's going on over here? And he's like, watch. He takes up the bell and he starts shaking it. And then he looks at her and he waits. And she's like, you're crazy. <laughs> and he's like, he's like what? what? And, he, and he picks up the bell again and he shakes it again. And he looks around. He says, I don't understand. He says, when I was by my uncle, I, the, he shakes this bell and there's four servants that came every single time. Every single time. Says the Dubna Magid. He says, you know, like, of course he had the servants because he paid for them beforehand and that's why they came with the bell. He says, the shofar has the ability to go and become like an axe. Break open all the doors. But there's one criteria. You've got to hire the servants beforehand. You've got to go beforehand. And that is where we are right here, right now, today. You have to go. This is the tshuva that we need to do. The asherayam yodea tua, The nation that knows how to do the tua. If you go and you prepare, then that shofar, that silver bell is going to be able to break open any single door that you have. That is going to be able to go and, and, and get you anything that you need. Now... Let's try to put this whole thing together. I know we, we put on a lot of you know, information over here. We started off with Rav Sadia Gohan's 10 reasons on why we blow the shofar. Now let's go through all those 10 reasons and see if we can plug it in and we'll finish off with that. Number one, and now we're not going to go in order. Number one, we said that it's, why, why do we blow the shofar? Said Rav Sadia Gohan, it's a piercing wail. It wakes people up to do tshuva. And of course it wakes people up to do Shabbat because it, rem- it reminds us of where we were. It reminds us that we started off as a tkiah. We started off as one long sound. And then we broke up in the shvarim. We broke up our soul. But now we have the tua. We have the ability to go and do chuba and bring ourselves back to the tkiah. We have the ability to bring ourselves back to where we are. So of course it's a piercing well. It's a loud sound that's going to go and it's going to be able to go and bring us to do chuba. That's number one. Number two on the same note is the one that's going to... It echoes what the prophets told the, the Jewish people. Repent from your ways. Because the shofar is the same idea. It teaches you repentance. It brings you to their repentance. Number three, we said it humbles you. We said it humbles you. It's like thunder and lightning. You know, thunder. It's a, it, it's a loud noise that humbles you. That's why Rav Sadi Yagoan says, what's so important about being humble? We said ayeka. God says, where are you? The youth of ayeka. The importance of being humble. The important aspect of Shuvah is humility. We have to go and focus on our humility. That is to get rid of the arrogance. Number four, we said it blows. It's in, rem, in remembrance of the ram's horn, of Kedat Yitzchak. What is the remembrance of it? To show us, now that we know that we have to do Shuvah. Now that we know that we have to do, be humble. But how are we supposed to do that? 
do it out of love. Do it the way that, the way that all that went down by Yitzchak. Number five, we see that it says, it's, it's in reference to the sound that the, of the war cries when we're referring to the broken of the temple because there's consequences, unfortunately. If you don't do tshuva, if you don't mend your ways and you go and continue the way that you are, then what happened? We had the destruction of the temple. Number six, we says that it evokes the shofar blast of, the, of, of Har Sinai. And we said beside all that, also on the same note, on Mashiach, on resurrection of the dead, all those things it evokes. Why is that? Because it breaks things that are hidden. Hid, things that are hidden. So deep down, we all want to do tshuva. We all want to do it. But the power is in the shofar. The shofar has the ability to go and break open what's really hidden inside each and every single one of us. To go and break it up. This is the power of the shofar. And finally, it brings us to the pinnacle. And this is the coronation of the king. Why is it so important? Because the king has the ability to do whatever he wants when he's getting coronated. Like, he could change the rules, bend the rules, anything changes when the king is doing that. This brings everything into perspective. So when we're going and we're hearing the shofar sound, don't think of it as just a shofar sound. There's so much more to it. This is going to be able to break open your heart, bring you to this place that you need to be. Open your heart to the tshuva, bring you to this place that you need to be. You'll be able to follow the ayakah and be'ezad Hashem. We're able to actually go and follow the ways of the shofar. Start, even though we started with the tkiah, and we unfortunately broke up into a shvarim. But now through the tuah, through the actual blessings, through, what, through actually what the Torah tells us to do, yom tuah yalachem, the tshuva is the whole process of it, then we're going to be able to come back to a full tkiah. And be'ezad Hashem, may God may grant us a year of such amazing success. May everyone here, whatever you need, may God grant you, whether it be a shiduch, whether it would be panasa, whether it be you know children, whatever it is, happiness, you know, self whatever it is, may we have such an amazing year. May we get, grant this lesson and become the people that we actually really want to become. Any questions? Um, on Yom Kippur, at the end, it's a tekiah, right? It's one more, like the very end of Yom Kippur. There is also a show for blast, right? Oh, you're saying it's kiyag dola, like why, yeah. you're saying why is the big one? Yeah, that's a nice interpretation of it. I never actually thought about it, but you could, yeah, you could, you know, yeah. yeah. It's, it's um, you know, the, the, if you realize that the shofar, the shofar has, it's, it's at, at very particular times. And that it has to be done, you know, in a particular, you know, in a, in a particular way. There's so much powers and secrets behind it. And that's why, you know, for the men that go into the synagogue, they're blowing the shofar already since, you know, what's called, the, you know, since you're know, blowing it since, since, since Elul already. The whole month of Elul, they're blowing the shofar. Why? Because it gets us, you know, ready into that, into that, uh, into that state of it. And then you have, you know, the shofars constantly. On Rosh Hashanah, also you have the same idea. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, we're all descended from Adam, right? Yes. Uh, excellent question. The question is, is how can we get punished for Adam's deeds? And now the answer is, is that it's not Adam's deeds because we're all part of Adam. But then you could say that about child, and then child should be able to be punished for his father. No, no, no. And Adam, we're talking about, we're not just like, we were literally part. We, you know, Adam was, was a bunch of sparks. And we're all part of those sparks, those needs to talk. So we're all actually part of that sin. We're all actually... Now, can you fix the Chet of Adam? There's different the ideas on it, and we're not going to get into it. The Kabbalistic ideas, also in the names that you have to know before, after, you know, when the angel asks you when you die, what's your name? There's different ideas on what's the names referring to. The Chet of the, the... One of the punishments of, of after a person dies is, is the punishment of Adam. The shaking in the grave is the punishment of Adam. The people, you are able to get out of that. There, there's a, there's, it's a whole complex idea on it, but it's not just Adam did the sin, and now because we're descendants in it, we're also following up with it. We were part, unfortunately, of that sin as well. So because he was the first person, he, in essence, held the peace of every person? Yeah. A quick question. I forgot what you were talking about. You, like, you were rebuking someone for trying to be like Hashem, and like, be like Hashem. But I learned that you're supposed to, you want to be close, close to Hashem, how do you mean that you end with him? Like, Excellent question. Excellent question. Okay, so let me let me rephrase the question. So the question is, and, and I, I, I hope I'm asking it in the in the right way. So we know that um, it says in the pasuk that they ate from the tree because they wanted to be like Hashem. But why is that a problem? You're supposed to be want like Hashem. You're supposed to be like God. The answer is that you, when you look at it, God says, "Don't eat from the tree." God specifically said, don't eat from the tree. They said, no, let's eat from the tree because we could be like God. So they're, fi- they're, they're violating a direct commandment to, to be like God. But where did the essence of this, did this sin come from? This sin came from a, a, a way of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's rationalization. Because how do they rationalize it? They rationalize it like this. Let's say, listen, it says, let's say we're going to sin. 
But because we're going to sin, we're going to go down, but then we can overcome it so we can get even higher and we can get closer to God this way. So they basically went around in the circle to go and rationalize the sin. This is unfortunate what we do to ourselves also. We're about to do a sin and be like, okay, listen, I'm going to do this right now, but because of this, I'm going to be able to go and I'm going to listen to like three Torah classes after this. Because of this, yeah, I'm not so modest, but I'm going to give so much charity, it's not even going to make a difference. You know, like, we start rationalizing everything we do. That is the essence of the first sin. That's rationalization. The problem is rationalization, not trying to be like God. Right. We should try to be like God. Unless God specifically says, don't do this. Then don't think you're no better than God and then say, like, yeah, well, this is going to, you know, be better. Any other questions? Any other questions on the camera? No? Okay. Chazakobahu. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.